So today's webinar is on adverse event and safety reporting with our experts, Dixie Eklund and Dr. Robert Fox. Dixie Eklund is the Director of Operations for Neuronext through the Clinical Trials Statistical and Data Management Center at the University of Iowa. She's also a CTMC faculty member. And Dr. Robert Fox, a neurologist, is, a, is Vice Chair for Research in the Neuro, Neurological Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. So I'd like to give a very special thank you to them for joining our discussion today. And we will now start the webinar with a short video that summarizes a previous talk on adverse event and safety reporting. And then we will open it up for questions and discussion. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get this started. Please give me a heads up if you can't hear it. There are lots of ways of measuring safety. Adverse event reporting is really only one of the ways of measuring safety. So it's worth thinking about that there's um, one of the things that makes neurology trials often distinct from other types of trials in, in other places in medicine is that safety is often actually determinable on the primary outcome measure because the primary outcome measure in neurology studies is quite often neurologic function or neurologic outcome functional outcome. And if the thing that we're working with is acting on that neurologic outcome, it can either cause benefit, efficacy, or it can cause negative efficacy. And a lot of the things that we most care about in neurology trials would really be the things that do affect that outcome, that functional outcome, in either a positive or a negative way. So if you think of things like the uh, NINDS TPA stroke trial, the original stroke trial, could go way back to the, the example that everybody loves and uses over and over again, you know, really the the thing that matters most in that trial is obviously the, the primary functional outcome, and there seems to be benefit. And then what's the proper safety measure for that trial? Obviously, the most widely noted safety measure for that trial was the rate of hemorrhage. And then we argue about, well, is it, is it the rate of all hemorrhage, or is it the rate of symptomatic hemorrhage? And then how do we define symptomatic hemorrhage? But really, one really could have easily argued, and I think it's probably true, that more important than hemorrhage as a safety outcome is the effect on functional outcome at the end of the day, because the adverse neurologic outcomes caused by hemorrhage were already included in the primary outcome measure. So if there's a positive outcome measure despite that negative, and that negative toxicity is actually represented in that primary outcome measure, that's a measure of both efficacy and safety. And it's probably the most important way. So that's one way of measuring safety, and it's important to make that explicit because a lot of times if you don't explain it that way, people don't understand it appropriately. Um, the next thing is going to be other predefined safety outcome measures, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in future slides. In fact, I think a primary outcome measure, I think I jumped the gun and talked about that. And then the third way we're going to talk about it, um, and what most of what this talk focuses on, is monitoring of adverse, out of adverse events. So uh, this is the slide that really goes with what I was just saying about, um, no, no, I, I, that's right. This is the slide about predefined safety outcomes. So, um, so we talked about the primary uh, outcome being uh, important, and then let's talk about the second, which is the predefined safety outcomes. So predefined safety outcomes are going to be like adverse events, but these are going to be the adverse events that are of special interest uh, related to your therapy. They're going to be the adverse events that you either think are caused by your intervention or that other people are, think are caused by your intervention. And you're going to have a limited subset of them, and you're going to follow them much more closely than you follow all events. So be something that is a patient-oriented uh, endpoint that matters. They need to be things that you can uh, reasonably measure. They're going to be, need to th be things that you can identify in the time span that uh, you're collecting data. They should be objective to the full extent possible. The more that clinical judgment has to um, determine the event, the less likely it is going to be uh, believable or reliable to a user population after the study is published. It's got to use the available information. So I hinted at that earlier, but I mean, if the best way to determine the outcome measure is with a convalescent MRI, um, but you know, only 10% of your population gets a convalescent MRI and you're not willing to pay for a convalescent MRI in everybody, then that's not going to be good as part of the definition of your, your outcome. Um, as I said, these outcomes are going to be carefully defined. So I mean, if you had an outcome that was uh, um, uh, pneumonia, for example, you'd want to have a very specific definition of pneumonia because there's all sorts of gradations of pneumonia uncertainty, and uh, um, 
you want to be able to have a definition, sort of like the definitions that the CDC uses for uh, different levels of pneumonia. You can say that it needs to be uh, clinical and radiographic and have a physiologic parameter, so it has to have fever and a abnormal x-ray. culture as well. So it can be a narrow definition if you want it to be uh, really objective and really uh, um, uh, well-defined, but you want to balance that against uh, it being practical. Uh, it needs to be communicable as well. By that, what I mean is that you can't have the definition be so complicated that it takes up a paragraph in the protocol, and at the end of the day, when you have to present the paper, you'll say, uh, you know, this adverse event, pneumonia, in our pur for purposes of the study, has to have this and this and this and this and this, and it takes a paragraph to describe it, that won't be accessible uh, to the audience when, you have, when you're done with the, the study. So the definitions should be concise, um, but meet all these criteria. And you're going to spend, you really should spend a fair amount of time getting some real uh, agreement from a significant user community about uh, how you find these predefined safety outcomes that you're going to follow. Um, so adverse events are any untoward <clears throat> medical occurrence occurring in a subject, and uh, so that can be anything that's negative. We usually talk about <clears throat> negative things that at least require some degree of <clears throat> intervention or treatment. Uh, when we define the adverse event, it's very important that we report it in an informative way. So the thing that is most useful is to report syndromes or diagnoses if those can be inferred. So, um, and then and then that's as opposed to just symptoms if we can't infer anything about the, the pathology or the mechanism. So, so if, for example, somebody has fever and cough and an infiltrate on their chest x-ray, um, you could report that as three separate adverse events, fever, cough, and, and abnormal finding on the chest x-ray, but it would be much more informative to put those three things together and say that's probably pneumonia and uh, report the syndrome or the diagnosis of pneumonia. There's some clinical judgment involved in that, and that's fine, that's important, that's why we've uh, got uh, trained physicians doing clinical investigations. Um, but that is by far more meaningful in being able to analyze at the end of the day because we're going to analyze by the reported terms. If you have somebody who has a fever and cough and a normal chest x-ray, that's going to be a more difficult clinical judgment. It could be reported as pneumonia still if that's what the clinical impression is. You don't have to know for certain. You just have to think that is most likely what's going on. You want to be as accurate as you can. Um, if the clinician, through their judgment, is not convinced that that fever and cough uh, represent pneumonia, then those can still be, those could be a different diagnosis entirely. It could be bronchitis or something like that. Or they could be just reported as symptoms. If it's reported as symptoms, then it can't be an event that is fever and cough because the symptoms, those symptoms are not uh, groupable without a syndrome or a diagnosis. So if you wanted to report just fever and cough, you'd have to report separate events. One event for fever and one event for cough. If you want to report them together, you need to get the syndrome or diagnosis that groups them. Um, so just as important as what are adverse events or what aren't adverse events, and, and these are where we get into um, uh, some difficulties and some people really have trouble grasping you know, a couple of these terms. But the things that are not adverse events and do not need to be reported as adverse events themselves are outcomes. So things like death, surgery, and trachea intubation, for example, are not adverse events. Uh, why aren't they adverse events? They're not adverse events because they don't tell us anything about the medical condition that occurred. <clears throat> so it's not that they're not adverse. There's no question that they're adverse, and, th and they might even be uh, events in of themselves. But much more importantly, they're the things that happen in response to an event. So uh, you have um, a myocardial infarction, and uh, as the result of being in the trial, or even as you know, just while you're in the trial, and then you die. The event is the myocardial infarction. It's a fatal myocardial infarction. So death is the outcome from the myocardial infarction. Uh, surgery is performed with some indication. The indication for the surgery would be the adverse event. Surgery would be the outcome, etc. So the one people that have the hardest time with is death. So people say, how can death not be an adverse event? We find why they died, and that's the event, and then we mark it as a moral, fatal adverse event. But the, the name of the event should be something other. 
Other things that don't need to be reported are pre-existing conditions. And there's a uh, one important exception to that. But things that happened, the diagnoses that happened prior to enrollment in the trial do not need to be reported. So if somebody has uh, fever and cough um, before they get enrolled, and then they get enrolled in your trial, and then while they're in the hospital, somebody says, oh, did you notice they have a fever and cough and gets an x-ray and they diagnose pneumonia? That pneumonia that is diagnosed on x-ray after uh, enrollment does not get reported as an adverse event if from history it's clear that the, that the symptoms actually began before the enrollment in the trial. The exception to that is when a pre-existing condition, something that was already present at the time of enrollment, gets suddenly, precipitously, dramatically worsened uh, over the, dur during the clinical trial. So if you come in with uh, pneumonia or some other chronic condition, but all of a sudden after treatment it gets dramatically worse, then that can still get uh, reported as an adverse event. It should be reported as an adverse event. Again, it's a judgment call as to which of those is the case. And, and that's really why uh, most deaths uh, are still reportable as adverse events. Because a lot of times the death is going to be, especially in the kind of uh, acute care um, uh, trials that, uh, that some of us do, people come in with a uh, uh, condition like a huge stroke that has a very high expected mortality anyway, and they get enrolled in the study because of their huge stroke, and then they die after enrollment of their huge stroke, then what is the event? The, the event was stroke. Um, the stroke was a pre-existing event, so you wouldn't normally report that as an adverse event. But one usually can make the argument pretty clearly that if it went from being, uh, if you went from having a stroke and being alive to a stroke and being dead, that that was a precipitous worsening of the uh, underlying condition. I'm not actually sure it always is, but uh, but that's the way it's usually handled. Other things that uh, are not adverse events are abnormal result, results of tests if those results are not considered by the investigator to be clinically significant. Um, so it is uh, common uh, for a lot of sites and a lot of clinical trials just to take everything, every blood test that is done that has a parameter that is outside of the laboratory's list of normal ranges and report all those as non-serious adverse events. Um, that's allowed, uh, but I think is, is poor practice. So most things that fall out of abnormal ranges are not clinically significant uh, and don't need to be reported. Um, in the, it's, it's actually, uh, I think, a little bit ironic that th this is actually a practice that has gotten worse in recent years because it used to be that uh, in the age of paper medical records, we would just print up a list of the patient's lab values for their whole stay, and they, it was very easy for the site investigator to go through that list and just mark NCS for not clinically significant uh, on every abnormal result that really didn't have any significant meaning. Um, and then that piece of paper could be saved in the file and was very easy to use as a source document when, when monitoring came around. Now the problem is you know, twofold. First of all, we order a friggin' more lab tests. Everybody seems to get you know, more lab tests every day in the hospital than, than when I was a student. And, uh, and it's harder to annotate those uh, because they're all in the electronic health record and it's usually much easier for a monitor to pull them out the electronic health record to make sure that nothing's missing. And so it's, it's hard to annotate them as, as not clinically significant in the electronic health record for research purposes. Um, but those don't need to be reported. Other things that don't need to be reported as adverse events are other people's problems and your misses. So events that happen, sometimes in clinical trials, you have safety things or adverse things that happen to somebody other than the subject. Um, and the example that I, that I always use for this most clearly was in, the, uh, in our Rampart study where we were using auto-injectors with midazolam versus, or, or placebo to give ion benzodiazepines to pre-hospital status, the, the auto-injector had a big orange end where the needle comes out, and that is always supposed to go against the patient's skin. And when you hold the auto-injector, you're supposed to hold it around the ends without moving any fingers or, or thumbs anywhere near the ends of the auto-injector so that you don't get stabbed. But every now and then, a paramedic would hold the auto-injector upside down so that the needle end was away from the patient instead of toward the patient, and then hold it with their thumb right over that orange end. And then when they plunged it against the patient, the needle would come out and stick through their thumb and spray the contents of the auto injector against the ceiling of the ambulance or sometimes into their thumb. Uh, it was adverse. It happened a few times out of 1,023 uh, treatments. Um, but it wasn't an adverse event because it didn't occur to a subject. Um, other things that, and we'll get to in a second, those are reportable safety problems, but they're just not adverse events. And we'll talk about how they are reported in a second. The other thing that falls into that category are near misses. So usually protocol deviations that could have hurt um, a subject but didn't. So something that happened that wasn't supposed to happen and it was an accident and it was a problem potentially needs to be 
uh, remediated, um, but nobody, you know, no harm done, no foul, no blood, and nobody actually gets hurt, so it becomes not an adverse event. So those kinds of protocol deviations are also reportable, uh, but not adverse events. All right, so um, sorry if that was a little soft for some of you, um, but I think um, at this point in time, we, we now have uh, doc Dr. Fox and, and Dr. Eklund. Um, I think if there's, you know, anything, obviously there's a, there's a lot here and we have some, we're starting to get some questions from the, uh, from the audience, um, but if you had anything that you wanted to just kind of add at the, a high level first. I, I think uh, that that was an excellent uh, summary of uh, what goes into adverse event reporting um, and some of the considerations. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to think about this and um, hopefully we can get through uh, uh, with some questions to kind of shape, you know, where, where you want to go with this discussion. But you know, safety is always an endpoint in any clinical trial. Um, how you how you capture those events, how you summarize them, how you evaluate them. Um, there are lots of ways to do it. There are lots of wrong ways to do it, <laughs> or not necessarily wrong, but ways that muddy muddy up the waters. And I think that's a lot of what Rob uh, was getting to in his presentation. So I appreciate uh, that direction. Yeah, hi, this is Bob Fox. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry to be late finishing up with clinic, reviewing adverse events with patients in clinical practice. And of course, we're guided on this by trials and what trials show us. Um, and neurologic trials are, have the additional nuance of what is the underlying neurological condition, what is the expected progression of the disease versus what is an adverse. Um, outcome and adverse event that one can consider related or not related to the therapy. And so a lot of the tricky part is understanding what is a normal part of the disease, a normal course of the disease, and what is then a deviation from that. Uh, but in general, I think it's best to capture the data, to put it together, and then try to figure out once you have it, what is all well this is a multiple sclerosis trial, so we expect patients to have relapses, so that's an expected part, and that can get figured out later. Similarly, for serious adverse events, um, that is one defined by the local context. It's also defined within the trial. Often the trial protocol will define what is specifically not considered a serious adverse event, but rather an expected uh, progression or expected complication from the underlying disease. But I think the key is to try to collect the data as best as one can uh, to get the details so you're as clear and as defined. Um, a rash is a rash, but can you be more clear? You know, it's a rash from a fungal infection of the skin versus a rash uh, that looks typical of a drug reaction or a drug eruption. So trying to be as clear and detailed with what that is, and then later the data can get assimilated, lumped together, or split apart to better understand what that trial is trying to show us. That's great. The, one of the first questions we have there, and we do have some other questions that I have for you both, um, is, um, you know, the, this death, Death is adverse, but it is is not you know not reported as an adverse event by itself. Um, you know, in, in stroke trials, sometimes we, you know, somebody dies of their stroke, it's sort of pre-existing. We we come up with uh, neurologic worsening leading to death. Uh, it, you know, the 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 fatal SAE. Um, I'm definitely interested in both of your perspectives on on this because I think this is a constant area of confusion. It, it's one of the outcomes of, of an event. So when you go through the checklist uh, to determine whether something was a serious adverse event, there's certain criteria that everybody looks at and it includes, um, you know, was it life-threatening or death, um, which then puts it into um, uh, uh, level four or level five reporting. 
um, but it's the outcome of an event that happened. So the pneumonia was the SAE, but they died. Um, the, it, it may or may not have been related to whatever the intervention is. Um, there, there are several ways that you have to piece that apart to understand um, what the actual SAE was, whether it was an SAE by the regulatory standards, and then uh, what the outcome was. Yeah, I agree. It, it uh, is often defined within the protocol, uh, and the how the protocol is defining and, and indicating things should be recorded. And certainly in a paper, you would have, uh, in most cases, mortality listed as a secondary, you know, as a secondary endpoint, unless it was something that was, you know, if, if it's a study of people who are relatively healthy, and that's going to be a very infrequent occurrence, um, it, it, it's going to be accounted for somewhere in your study, but it's, it may not be listed in, in sort of one of the main outcome tables. So again, very good, very good explanation there that this is this is the result of an adverse event. And it, it can be, it can be, you know, the, these things can be, be a little weird um, in that. And then you can even get into the pre-existing condition type situation mm -hmm. where there, you know, the, the death is, is secondary to some pre-existing condition um, that maybe is completely unrelated to the, um, the, the study at hand. Like we, and, and, and oftentimes, you know, anything that leads to a hospitalization or potentially an emergency department visit is going to re meet the criteria for a serious adverse event. Um, but, you know, we did a, a thrombolytic trial and two months later, somebody had cholecystitis and had an operation to have their gallbladder out. You know, relatedness is, of course, something that, that also needs to be assessed. And in that case, it, it's hard to picture a causal relationship between a you know, two-hour infusion of a thrombolytic and two months later, a, a gallbladder uh, getting infected. But, you know, the patient could have died from that gallbladder surgery. And again, that, that sort of aids to um, the relatedness. You know, in that case, the adverse event is, is the cholecystitis and the end result of the cholecystitis would be death. So, I have two points to that. One is to just highlight death, although it sounds really important, is not nearly as important as the cause of death. So you may have death in a trial that is expected, but if you realize that all the deaths are coming from suicide, then you go, ah, well, maybe I'm actually impacting depression, and depression is what's leading to the suicide. So to understand why the deaths occurred ends up being so much more insightful, although death obviously is very important to the patient, to the family, and so on, and to the trial. But it's always the why of the death, which is so much more important than the death itself. Because if you understand the why, then you know, okay, well, that's just the underlying disease. Or no, that is this complication we haven't really appreciated related to the drug. So I think that's, that's an important part about death. In terms of causality, that can be tricky. There are some of the, the top tier journals who, they don't care about causality. They don't want to hear about causality. They don't want to know what our investigator thought about causality. They just want to see it listed. And if they, in your example, William, uh, if they see cholecystitis two months after you did the intervention, then it will be for the reader and, and the reviewer and people looking at that to say, okay, that's not important. But who knows? Maybe there's six cholecystitis in the treatment arm that comes two months later, and that points you to something that you didn't appreciate up to that point, even though all the investigators said it wasn't related. So many journals say, don't tell me about causality, just tell me what the results are, and later on we can kind of sort through whether we expect it, we don't expect it, is it causal, is it not? I also find it difficult as a in-the-trench investigator where I know a drug has a certain side effect. I don't know if they're on the drug or not. I see that side effect, and I'm told, is it from the treatment? I don't know. They report hearing loss. Is it from the treatment? Might be. Might not. How am I supposed to know if it's from the treatment that they have the hair loss? So at some level, the causality is, is an impossible thing to answer. And really, it's only answered when you look at the trial data in totality and understand, well, actually, we see no more hair loss in the treated group than the placebo, so I guess it's not related. Or, yeah, we are seeing a lot more hair loss, so I guess it is related. 
So it's almost figured out more later. Um, so I'm, I'm always weary of a causality and tend to ignore it in trials because uh, oftentimes it's somewhat of a, of a guessing game and no one really knows. I was involved in a trial where seizures were seen more commonly with the treatment group. Well, no one expected seizures with this drug, so no one said it was causal. But at the end, when we put the data together, there was more seizures. So we say, well, probably it was causal, at least based on what we can see in this trial. Or I guess if we want to be like uh, epidemiological purists, there's an association. Um, this causality can be hard to prove. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's 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 an association, and then it's up to the interpreter to decide, the reader to decide what it means. But it, it, it's even getting one step further away from an investigator seeing one patient on one day, seeing an adverse event, and saying yes or no. I don't know. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're not. Yeah, no, and I, and I think that's, you know, if you think of more uh, longitudinal studies where people are um, taking drugs for a long time, maybe drug versus placebo, you know, and we've all seen the commercials may cause occasional drowsiness. It's sort of like, you know, there's also the how, what's the baseline rate of a symptom like nausea, headache, occasional drowsiness, just in the population. And I think that, you know, in those larger studies where there's a placebo group, you know, it's, 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 it, it can be very important to contextualize that. Um, as this is this is a rate that that is expected in the population or in the diseased population. So those are, the, it, but but I think you're right. I mean, I think some of the classification um, has to do with uh, some of it is the temporality. You know, that, that some of the schemas look at you know how close in time to that did this happen to a to a drug? Is it plausible that the drug was still around at the time of the event and so forth? But you're right. I think at the at the top level journals, overly interpreting whether it was related or the relatedness can be can be problematic. And the most transparent approach is to to list things. But it can be a little bit of a challenge in terms of thinking about the next steps, particularly if you're in a, a smaller trial space. So I think there's a good question here. Should expected complications of an intervention be recorded as adverse events, or is it dependent on what is specified in the study protocol? Huh. I guess. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Fox. Right. Right. So, so that that could help. Oh, sorry. Um, that could get at you know if if you know that a drug intervention causes nausea. Um, are, and you've seen that in some of the preliminary trials. Do you want to report that? Um, absolutely, because it, especially as you move through um, trial progression, that's building that portfolio of actually seeing what are the expected adverse events with that drug. Um, you know, in the beginning, in the early phase of trials, you're looking for any signals, so everything needs to go in. But um, and it's not necessarily that. Um, uh, you want to pay more attention to things that are expected, but eventually it kind of clears itself out of, of uh, you know, what would be expected with certain drugs, and then you want to make sure that um, uh, you're documenting those so that adds to the portfolio of the drug um, profile. The other side of that is it can be somewhat unblinding. Um, if you're looking by groups in a clinical trial, um, because there are some known side effects, and and uh, if you start to see, um, oh, this group is seeing a lot of this, then it, it uh, can be um, unblinding depending on who's looking at that um, particular report as to um, which, which group is receiving which, which intervention. So I, I would totally agree with that. And the adverse event should be reported. And the study protocol may guide a little bit differently, and that ends up being the ultimate guide about how the study data is going to be reported. But in general, you do want to record adverse events, that even if they are known related to the intervention, because you want to know a couple of things. You want to know their frequency in this population. Is it more frequent? Is it less frequent? You want to know their severity. Is it a different severity? And usually you're doing this trial because it hasn't been done or it hasn't been done well enough before. And that usually means you're doing it in a different disease, a different age group, a different demographic, in different background comorbidities. 
you're doing it for a reason because the previous data trial didn't give you the answer you were looking for or didn't give you the clarity uh, applied to the right patients that you're interested in. And so you want to know how is it changed? Is it less frequent, more frequent, less severe, more severe? So absolutely, you do want to continue capturing those adverse events. I think what gets particularly tricky is whether you're documenting um, uh, uh, disease progression as an adverse event. Um, and that especially comes up in neurological trials um, because there's a lot of disease progression <laughs> to look at. So, you know, in MS, which is uh, Bob's area of study, or myasthenia gravis, you know, things that recur, wax and wane, um, is that is that something that you document um, as part of an adverse event? It's probably somewhere in your outcomes that you're looking for. So did they have disease progression demonstrated by some you know, measure where you're looking at that? Um, and so if there is a worsening, is that an adverse event or is that an outcome of the progression of the disease under study? I don't know if you want to go there on that discussion, Will. But, um. I mean, we could we could give another I give another example because I think you know, and if you want to give us some more um, detail, uh, Dr. Catalani, um, we could we you know we we may be but you could also think sort of on the other end. I did a cluster randomized trial of the Dix Hull Pike maneuver and improving its use amongst emergency physicians. If somebody was, if in the chart we found that somebody had persistent nausea or vomiting or strangely headache after the Dix Hull Pike was done, um, we would record that as an adverse event. Now, if it didn't change their, their sort of trajectory of care, it, it probably wasn't a serious adverse event. But if somebody had the, um, if somebody had a brief episode of vertigo that faded or a brief episode of nystagmus that faded, you know, that was basically a sort of expected diagnostic output of the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. And it was so time limited that it wasn't requiring treatment with a drug or, or follow up. That in those cases, if, there, if somebody reported they had vertigo with a Dix Hall Pike maneuver, that you know, wasn't something that we would have, have recorded as an adverse event. So it can, get, it can get a little tricky in certain cases, but I think generally, the um, intuition is it's better to collect broadly for the reasons that have been stated. Um, because also, I mean, particularly in early phase studies, oftentimes there may not be a lot of external oversight in terms of getting into the nitty gritty of the data collection and so forth. And, as, and you wanna be as transparent as possible about collecting things. And, and certainly if it's an early phase study that's under an IND, there, there's FDA guidance as to how carefully that you're, you're going to be collecting these things, but, but you may not have an external body that's, that's reviewing each of the adverse events. Um, so, so I think it's, it's, it's important to, to catalog them and annotate them. Yeah, I would agree. That's the key thing, is to catalog them, organize them, and to guide the investigators on the sorts of things that you're looking for that you're looking for to be expected related to the disease, expected related to the therapeutic intervention, whether it's a drug, a device, a maneuver, uh, and to help guide them in how to classify. At the same time, being open for things you don't expect, particularly with therapies that are relatively new and have limited experience in the particular disease you're studying. And not to belabor the Dix Hall Pike like example, but one of the things that sometimes people are a little nervous about neck problems or maybe causing a, a arterial dissection in the neck. So we we didn't identify any of those issues, but we we actually screened our population extra hard for whether any you know anything like that had occurred later in that hospitalization or in the case of dissection if patients came back with a stroke. So that was you know, so even though those are rare complications, we were even wanted to be extra cautious to have a process in place to look for them. But if, if, if it was, if, if I was like to be looking for agranulocytosis after a Dix Hall Pike maneuver, we didn't set up any sort of special kind of surveillance for that because it just seemed, it, it seemed like there, there, you know, the biologic link would be very tenuous um, on that. But if I was giving a drug that could potentially cause agranulocytosis, I might want to have a, a deeper uh, screening process for patients come back with that later. <laughs>
I do think it's important to, um, as you plan a trial, um, think about what are the safety events, what are the signals, um, and part of that has to, we've alluded to this a little bit, the phase of the trial that you're looking at. Um, I'm thinking of, we did a, a trial in, that was mostly a feasibility trial, of taking different samplings and biopsies to look for synuclein in Parkinson's. And the whole trial was built around, you know, how feasible is it to obtain these samples? One was a submandibular um, gland biopsy, which is, you know, not a benign procedure unless you ask an ENT doc and then they think it's totally benign. But um, so we built a huge uh, profile of bruising, hematoma, bleeding, um, you know, which normally you wouldn't really want to report all of that if um, it was a, you know, known procedure that, you know, we, we would understand the risks of that. Um, and, but uh, because it was going to be used as, as a feasibility measure, then it was important to capture just how, how much more risk is there in doing a submandibular gland biopsy compared to a, you know, a saliva sample or a colon biopsy um, um, sample, all the different ways that we were um, working in that trial to obtain synuclein. So, and so that, you know, is a different kind of way to think about how you're going to describe and evaluate and summarize those events compared to you're in a phase three trial, you're, you know, there's known things, you're going to collect things, um, you, you can over collect to the point where you muddy any kinds of, of um, true safety signals. Um, uh, but, you know, you always want to, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real trade-off between, uh, you know, how much you're collecting, how you're describing it, and then how you're summarizing it, depending on what type of trial you're doing. So there's another thing that can be a little tricky, and that's classifying laboratory abnormalities as adverse events or not. And uh, I'm always a little suspect of study reports where they say, well, here's the frequency that the investigator said the liver functions were in AE. I'm like, I don't really care whether they thought it was not. I want to know how many met criteria five times up and the normal eight times or, you know, whatever interval are chosen. I don't want to rely on that next step of the investigator saying, ah, oh, yeah, I think that's an AE, therefore I'm going to report it. I'm, I'm much more comfortable with the study protocol defining if liver enzymes are five times upper limit of normal, it is an AE and needs to be reported. And then I get a little bit more comfortable that there is going to be comprehensive report to the AE. Otherwise, you just, just go back to data and say, what's the frequency of liver functions over five times upper limit normal and not get into the, well, was it an AE and how is it coded and so on. Now, there are many reasons for liver enzymes to be elevated, so it's not a perfect way either. Uh, but it, it always makes me a little nervous when we're relying on the investigators to then interpret the lab if the protocol doesn't clearly define things. Yeah, no, I mean, that's an absolutely excellent point. Um, and, you know, again, and sort of, but also thinking of if there are things that are other things that are being collected, you know, how, how high does the potassium have to be or how low does the potassium have to be? It, because different sites may have slightly different reference values, but there's, there's, there's sort of an amount that is, is kind of noise and it's not necessarily um, leading to, um, you know, real adverse outcomes. I mean, I, at one level, you know, I do, I do research in cardiac arrest. So the sick cardiac arrest patients who are in the hospital mm -hmm. afterwards you know, have basically, there's, there's at least as many AEs or SAEs as there are patients. Um, you know, basically their entry criteria into the study was an SAE, like BTAC leading to, you know, coronary disease leading to BTAC leading to death. So, um, but, but, it, but it is also important to contextualize things, right? Like, is this, is this something that is, um, you know, part of, like, as we talked about before, part of disease progression or, but but setting boundaries for the labs that are being monitored, I mean, particularly for drug studies, I think is 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 a crucial part of setting up the adverse event plan for the for the protocol. Because you're right, you want to take subjectivity out of it, um, and there always are going to be some aspects where there's subjectivity. We've seen that in some of our emergency network trials, just in terms of the frequency of adverse events for 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 the seizure. You know, he was talking, Dr. Silver was talking about the seizure trial. Some sites reported more than others. 
we wanted to try to standardize the quality as much as possible. But when when you when you don't have um, clear boundaries as to you know what are the thresholds for reporting, then you're going to have more variability. I think that leads to um, whether you're coding um, events um, and, you know, that if you're doing your own trial and, um, you know, collecting a, a few events across a few, few uh, participants, that's different than whether you're, you're partici participating in a multi-center trial where there's lots of different events. There are coding languages out there that help to summarize um, these events so you collapse them into a category. Um, but, you know, it's, it's amazing uh, how many look very similar, but maybe have a slight difference. Um, and you can have a disagreement on how to code those things. Um, I, uh, we uh, at our data center prepare reports, of course, for, you know, the IRB and for the data safety monitoring boards and, and uh, do all this coding. But I'm looking at one for a trial we're doing in neuropathy. And there's events under nervous system, which is where most of the neurological um, uh, uh, adverse events go to. And you know the, the things that it codes down to the next level are burning sensation, cognitive disorder, dizziness, headache, hyperesthesia, hypoesthesia, loss of consciousness, memory impairment, neuralgia. You know, and uh, how an event collapses down to that is kind of a pathway, and you need to have people with expertise to think about that. But if you can get it to that level, then you can really see signals between two different groups um, um, at using a classification system. And there, there are several out there, but most people tend to use Medra. And I think for the clinician investigators, I mean, we've been, you know, if we haven't been deep into research and clinical trials before, we're mostly on the consumer end of this. And the, the this is sort of like, you know, when you ride a boat under a bridge, you're like, wow, that bridge is really complicated. But, but kind of when you drive over it, it's like, it's, oh yeah, it's cool. It's, it's keeping me out of the Straits of Mackinac. Um, but, but when you see it, what's underneath to get to that summary table in the New England Journal article, it's, right. it's a lot of these things. And, it, it, and it's, it's beneficial because if you, if you have a lot of sort of free structured uh, sort of narratives, you're like, this is neurologic worsening. This is cerebral edema. <laughs> this is progression of neurologic disease. And you're like, those things all kind of sound like the same thing. Like mm -hmm. how do, it's, it's easier to miss that signal when, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have, you know, 500 patients, but things are, are split up into 30 different categories that all sound kind of the same. Um, it, it's, mm -hmm. and that, that is, it is, you know, you know, particularly for the, and it's, even though you're like, well, I'm only doing my, 50 patient study of this, getting into that habit because gosh, you're gonna hopefully borrow upon that protocol for the next study that you design. And so I think, you know, again, I, I sometimes over engineer things, but I think having a consideration as to how you classify under one of these systems, um, a lot of the great trials in your field may have already been published with their protocols available in New England Journal or other journals. And you can look through those protocols and see like those detailed plans for how they were accounting for things. and and adapt them for, for your smaller trials. So again, you don't, I, mean, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed, like, oh gosh, this is another thing. Um, but you know, the, better, the better you do this, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna pay dividends down, down the line because it's gonna make it, you know, one, it's gonna pay dividends for the patients because I think you'll be more able to detect things that are important. And two, I think it's just gonna make your life easier in terms of how you're designing the trials in the future. Well, in Maine, what you're looking for can help. I work with immune therapies, and so one of the worries we have is opportunistic infections. So everyone knows about PML, but when you're, you're trying to characterize the adverse events, you want to figure out how you're going to roll up so you can pick up other opportunistic infections and have a broader net uh, to get a, a, a broad-based assessment of the adverse events. So knowing what you're looking for, as, as you were alluding to, I think is very important because it helps guide you on how you should bend things together. It looks like Dr. Conwit has asked a question of Dr. Fox of thinking about an unanticipated SAE in one of your, your trials. 
and how it was dealt with. What were the sort of special additional things that had to be considered for an unanticipated SAE? Well, uh, I won't answer it directly. I'll, I'll answer it around the corner in a couple of ways. So one is to identify someone who can be an arm's length from the study to help with these evaluations. So uh, the Sprint MS or NN102 study within the Neuronex network, we had an independent medical monitor. So this was someone within academia, but not connected to or at any of the sites that were enrolling and following patients, but someone familiar with the MS world and MS clinical trials who could look at the safety events that were coming and can make some adjudication and to raise red flags about things. Now, fortunately, we didn't have any red flag raising serious adverse events. We had a couple of serious adverse events, but they were thought to be one-offs or directly related to the disease course of progressive MS. So we, we didn't have to wrestle with that, but it was in part because we had put into place someone who we charge, okay, you're doing nothing in the study, but advocating for the patients, reviewing the serious adverse events, the summary adverse event tables that came from Iowa that would uh, summarize how, how things were, were going. So that helped, is to have someone that let me off the hook as the, as the overall protocol PA and let him be the main person who is in charge of ensuring the safe, the safety and welfare of our participants. Now, he did observe, this was uh, Dr. Stephen Krieger at Mount Sinai, he observed that the frequency of new lesions on MRI were much higher than he would have expected as an MS clinician taking care of patients with progressive MS. And so as a result, he actually sounded an alarm to the Data Safety Monitoring Board uh, over an increased rate of new lesions on MRI. Now, he was blinded to treatment assignment, so he was doing that looking at the aggregate data, looking at the frequency of disease activity as measured by MRI by that aggregate data. What we came to learn when we dove into it more deeply was that the new lesions in MRI were being identified by an automated software program, which is much more sensitive. And we also had a radiologist, actually a single central radiologist, that was reading all of the MRIs as well. And that radiologist read uh, about one in five lesions that the software identified. Uh, so that was an interesting analysis in and of itself, which we're now writing up and trying to figure out. But what it allowed us through the safety mechanism of an independent medical monitor and then the data safety monitoring board is that the medical monitor can identify a potential problem, a potential concern, can bring it to the data safety monitoring board. We can take a deeper dive into the data realized we were getting automated computer identified lesions on the one hand he was making his clinical judgment based on radiologist read because that's how we practice uh, and once we put it all together we felt much more comforted uh, the dsmb was comforted and allowed things to proceed we didn't have to change anything and indeed at the end of the study there was no increase rate of new lesions as measured by the radiologist but there was by the software and we're exploring that further. So um, it was an area that showed the benefit of having an independent medical monitor who can then raise the concern with the DSMB, brought me in to get my input and my insight and, and diving deep into the data. We relied on the data coordinating center at Iowa to, to pull together additional details. Uh, and then we were able to figure out a, a good solution. Yeah, but some of those things, you don't know what's going to happen until it does, and then you just dive into the data and figure it out. One of the... ...has any burning questions they want to get addressed. Um, I'm sort of itching to, to possibly... I know that some people are on stacked Zoom calls the whole day, uh, give people at least a couple of minutes of their day back. Um, but but one thing that I, I, I think that, that we, we also do is we try to work, we have like a preliminary step 
before we send things to the independent medical monitor. And at, at certain early phase studies, you may not have all of these layers, but somebody, you know, having an independent body who's looking through these things is important. But we do have an in, a, a internal quality reviewer that helps work with the sites to make sure that their little narratives are most, you know, to improve the efficiency of what the, um, the busy independent medical monitor has to look at. You know, if the site turns in an adverse event and says death, like patient died of stroke. We're like, well, can you give us a little bit more detail? Because like, you know, that, what was the events? What was, you know, et cetera. So, so we have that added layer where we work to improve the narrative as well so that when the independent body is looking through things, they can kind of make their assessments and it, it just, it, you know, improve their efficiency. So that's been another thing that we've found to be an effective step too. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at this point, um, I know, uh, I think Joy will put the evaluation link back into the uh, chat area. Um, did Dr. Fox and Ms. Eklund, um, thank you so much for, for the, your time today. Or do you have any mm -hmm. other closing thoughts? Uh, the only thing I would add or, or to emphasize is the more you can think out ahead of time, the better. The more you can identify common areas of confusion where you can script things to get better clarity, get better understanding. The more you can think ahead, the less chasing your tail you are later trying to figure things out and chasing mm -hmm. down investigators. So uh, understanding where the confusion can often come prevents prevention better than a whole lot of elbow grease of cure. I guess I would also add, um, you know, don't be driven by, you know, you're afraid of, you know, what the IRB will think, or you're afraid of what the sponsor will think, or you're afraid of, you know, there, there is so much that um, uh, gets just muddied up from that kind of fear-driven reporting um, that, you know, if you take a little time and, and think ahead about how you should be managing safety in your trial and then prepare you know, it, depending on the complexities of the trial, uh, a simple or a more complex way to track that and document that, and then, you know, adhere to, to your guidelines. But, you know, it, that any IRB will tell you, or a DSMB, you know, just, you know, throwing stuff on the wall is, um, is not uh, uh, an effective way to really be able to evaluate um, safety of a trial. And that's really what the, what the end goal is. Um, and uh, I think people can get caught up in that sometimes uh, to not to the benefit of uh, the overall trial. All right, well, thank you everybody. And our next webinar is in uh, two weeks on um, the- It's on ethical issues in acute and chronic neurological con conditions on September 15th at noon. So be on the lookout for a reminder. Great. All right. Sorry, thank Will. You. <laughs> no, you, you were, I was like, I was like looking like, I know. like read my <laughs> notes, so, all right. <laughs> Well, well, thank you, everybody, and thank you. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Yeah, it was good training. Bye, 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 bye.